Will you turn your Bibles with me to the Gospel of John chapter 5? One of the things that my children love to do is swim. And swimming has become a very popular thing. Uh, several weeks ago, we bought one of those two and a half foot pools uh, from Academy and set it up in the backyard. Well, Mitzi set it up in, in the backyard. I can't do any of that kind of stuff. And so that was, that's been a lot of fun. And, and whenever we take a, a quick overnight trip to Montgomery, which we've done once or twice this summer already, our, my, our kids have swam in the pool at the hotel and that's why they enjoy going to Montgomery. And we're looking forward in the end of July going up to Hot Springs to, to do some swimming up there. But we don't have a local pool in our area that's free, that do, wouldn't cost us anything that our kids could swim in, a, a real pool. And so I always have kept in mind of and kept looking for places that might be free or might have a very reduced cost uh, to the swimming. And, and I was uh, remind, thinking a while back about the New Orleans Baptist Seminary. I actually had gone there uh, several years ago to to get my master's degree. I, I started in January of 2002. And I can remember during our opening orientation, they said, now we do have a pool on campus. It's free for students to use and uh, it's, it's there for you. And, and so I started in 02 and, and finished in 05, but never once did I swim in that pool. But I've always remembered that there was a pool there on the campus. Well, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a person who's over uh, currently at the Baptist Seminary, and, and we were talking, and the topic of the pool came up, and, and the person said, well, Eric, you know, as alumni, you can swim there for free. And I thought, we can? And, and so I got all excited about this, and they said, well, all you have to do is have a, an alumni photo ID. And I said, well, where do you get that? And they said, Dean of Students Office. And I said, all right. So I got Mitzi all excited, I got the kids excited, and we're making the 30 mile trip to Gentilly to go swimming for free. I'm sure we spent quite a few bucks in gas. But we're going over and I said to the kids, now listen, there is a chance, a small chance, that we're not gonna get into this pool. We have to get past four people on campus in order to get to the pool. We've got to go through the, the Dean of Students Secretary, the Dean of Students, the Security Guard, and then the Lifeguard at the pool. So at any point, this could go south. And so we drive and we pull in and we go into the main area. And so I said, y'all stay in the car. And so I got out to the Dean of Students and the Secretary was there and I told her I'd like to get a alumnus ID. And, and she said, all right, well, I think we can do that today. The Dean of Students is not here, but I think I can do this myself. And so I thought, well, the one down, th th two more to go after this. And, and so we go in, and she snaps a picture, get the, the ID in less than five minutes. And I thought, this is too good to be true. And so we, we turn out, and then we start going to the main part of the campus, and that's where you have to get past the security guard. And so we get over there, and it's this big, big fella. He's got these big, big earrings and long hair and long beard. And I'm thinking, where did this guy come from? He wasn't there when I was a, a student, but I'm thinking, okay, he looks like a pretty good guy. And so he said, all right, well, can I see your ID? I told him we want to go to the pool. So I showed him this fresh new alumni photo ID. And he said, no, not that, your driver's license. So I said, all right, so I've got a driver's license. He led us right through, no problem. I thought, all right, this is, we're in real good shape. Only one more person, the lifeguard at the entrance of the pool. So we go and park and we get out of the car and we get there into the entrance and the lifeguard has his hand out like this. So I'm thinking, he wants to shake my hand. I have no idea who this is. So I go and I, I shake his hand and, and then he, we, that ended and I took my hand back, but his hand was still out. And I thought, this fellow wants some money. This, this is no longer free. So I start going to get my wallet and take some cash out and he says, no, no, it's not free. I need to see your ID. So I gave him my driver's license. He said, no, not your driver's license, your alumni ID. So I gave him that and he said, all right, you guys are go right in. And we were able to swim at the pool. A big ordeal, but 12 and a half years later, 
we were able to swim in that pool for the very first time. Well, in our text this morning in John chapter 5, we learn about a fella who has been around a pool for a long, long time. Not 12 and a half years, but actually 38 years, this paralyzed fella has been sitting around this pool at Bethesda. And as we come to our text in John chapter 5, we learn of some bad news up front. And the bad news is this. There is a man who could not start walking. There was a man who could not start walking. Notice with me the first several verses of John 5, beginning in verse number 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool. Now scholars don't really quite know exactly what that was. Some translations, in your fact, your Bible might have the word gate in italics. They really don't know if the, the, the word gate belongs there. And, but many have added it with the idea that this was one of the gates that led into the city of Jerusalem. And most probably and likely, the gate in which sheep entered. And so this Lamb of God is talking, about to talk to these folks by, as far as the sheep gate, a pool, which is in Hebrew, Bethesda, which ironic enough, the word Bethesda means the house of mercy. And as we're going to notice, there were many, many people here that were not experiencing much mercy at all. It had five porches. In verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. As we look at this text this morning, we understand that the bad news is there was a man who could not start walking. As we make three observations about this man who could not start walking, we understand that number one, he was powerless. Look again in verse number three. The word there, as far, the word sick, great multitude of sick people. The original idea coming out of the Greek language is that this is a person without power. It's the exact opposite of omnipotent. It's a word that means without power. This particular fellow lying around this pool for 38 years was powerless. In fact, he wasn't the only one. Everyone that was around that pool lacked power in some form or fashion. They may have not been able to see. They may have not been able to hear. They may have not been able to walk. And they certainly didn't have any method of healing themselves. And I don't know about your particular situation this morning. I, I don't know if you identify with any of these types of folks listed in verse number three. But all of us know what it's like to feel powerless in this life. To, to be out of energy. To feel like as if we have lost control or have no control whatsoever. We know what it's like to be powerless. Also in verse number five, as we've mentioned already, secondly, this man who couldn't start walking, not only was he powerless, but he was hopeless 
as well. Verse 5 reminds us that he had been in this condition for 38 years. Now, 38 years is a long time. Some of us were not even born 38 years ago. But if I'm doing my math right, 38 years ago would be, bring us back to the year 1976. That's the year that, that Jimmy Carter was elected president, defeating Gerald Ford. It's 1976 was the year that Fidel Castro became president of Cuba. 1976 was the year that Steve Jobs began the company called Apple. 1976 was when a new genre of music, and I know some of you, your parents didn't like that you started listening to punk rock music. 1976 was the year that the $2 bill was released. The average cost of the new house was $43,000. The annual Average annual income was $16,000, and a gallon of gas in 1976 cost 59 cents a gallon. For 38 years, so if in our minds, if we're thinking from 1976 to 2014, this fella is lying around a pool in Bethesda, hopeless and powerless. Some of us may be dealing with some things that have hurt us and have caused us pain and worry for a very long time and we might actually feel hopeless as well. Think about this in this regard. This fellow has been lying around this pool for 38 years. Jesus during this account was 30 years himself and so for eight years while Jesus was still in heaven this fellow was lying around this pool. When Jesus was born and when he was brought into the temple as a young baby, this fellow was lying around the pool. At age 12, when Jesus was teaching in the temple and, and, and doing all of those great things, this fellow was lying around the pool. Some of us may be dealing with a situation right now where we have literally given up hope on the situation getting better. It may be some type of family relationship. It might be some type of financial constraint. It might be our career. It might be some type of physical sickness or disease of some sort. All of us know what it's like to be without hope. And I think it's very fair to mention here as we look ahead for a moment to verse 14 that some of us are hopeless because of the sin in our lives. Now of course not every physical or emotional or relational issue that we deal with is the result of sin but it does seem at least from what Jesus says at the end of verse 14 some of what this was going on in this paralyzed man's life for 38 years had something to do with some type of sin that was occurring. What all of us need to realize is as if we live a life of sin, we are truly hopeless. It may feel like things are going, on, going well right now, but from an eternal perspective, living a life of sin is living a life without hope. And as we look again at verse number seven, this particular fella, this man who could not start walking, he was powerless, he was hopeless, and number three, he was helpless as well. In verse number seven, the, the sick man is saying, well, I don't have anybody to put me into the pool. And when there is opportunity to go in, other folks go before me and I don't even ever get my chance. And so this was certainly a very helpless situation. Some of us at times feel helpless as well. In fact, a very popular psychologist, Martin Seligman, describes this as learned helplessness. And he says that learned helplessness is being repeatedly exposed to an uncontrollable event. 
such as going on interviews or auditions or not getting called back. And after many failed attempts to accomplish something, our brains learn that success is beyond our control, that we cannot affect the outcome. And we can, according to Martin Seligman, become conditioned to this belief in which the individual gives up hope and effort even when later exposed to an event where control is possible. In effect, we can learn to become helpless. You and I do not want to be powerless. You and I do not want to be hopeless. And we certainly do not want to be helpless either. So that was the bad news. There was a man who could not start walking. But the good news this morning as we continue in verse number 8 is that there was the man, Jesus Christ, who could not stop working. One man couldn't start walking, but Jesus could not stop working. Notice in verse number 8 of our text, Jesus said to this man, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. By the way, for tonight's sermon, we are going to study the idea of Jesus being Lord of the Sabbath. But verse 11, Jesus answered them, he who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn, a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. The man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father has been working until now, and I have been working Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath but also said that God was his father making himself equal with God. This man was powerless but Jesus number one was powerful. Look again in verse number eight. Jesus was able to very quickly even though it had been 38 years, within a moment of time, Jesus was in his power, was able to heal this man, and he was told to, to rise up and to take up his bed and walk. Now we realize that John is recording these signs and miracles in the first century to demonstrate and to prove that Jesus Christ is the true Son of of God, that he is equal with the Father, because it is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And although miracles don't occur today as they did in the first century to this extent, we do know that our Savior, Jesus Christ, remains entirely and completely powerful over our lives and in this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul is, the Apostle Paul is reflecting upon the thorn in his flesh. And he's reflecting on what the Lord said to him in verse number 9. It says, the Lord speaking to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And though, so Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. In Philippians 3, Paul is reflecting upon this powerful nature of Jesus Christ. And he says that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. 
And in Revelation chapter 5 verses 12 and 13 as the Apostle John is seeing some things and reflecting upon how awesome heaven is going to be. The Bible says in verse 12 of Revelation 5, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. No matter what it is that we are feeling this morning, if we're feeling powerless, we need to understand that Jesus Christ is powerful. Secondly, as we're looking at verse number 14 of our text, we notice that this man that could not start walking, he was also hopeless. But Jesus Christ, who could not stop working, is hopeful. Jesus is filled with hope. And our lives as we live in reflection and in obedience and faith to Jesus, we too can experience a life of hope. There's a true story of a Christian lady who was a teacher. And she wasn't the type of teacher that goes to a school every day and teaches students lessons. But she was a teacher that had a special assignment, a special task, a special job, and that she would go into hospitals, children's hospitals, and teach students lessons that they would have learned at school, but could not because they were in some type of long-term hospital setting. And so the idea, of course, is so that they wouldn't get too far behind in their studies. And so every day, this Christian lady, this teacher, she would receive a name and a room number and go and teach that lesson in the hospital room. And so one day she was given an English lesson on, on nouns and verbs and was sent to the, the burn unit to see this one of these children there at the hospital. And she just didn't realize how bad things were. And so this young boy was wrapped in gauze from head to toe. And you could tell it was obvious that he was in a lot of pain. And this was the first time this teacher had been there to teach him this, this lesson in English. And so she introduced herself and began the lesson and he could barely groan, much less acknowledge that she was in the room. She felt very badly herself for putting him through the lesson knowing he was in such a tough condition. But it was her job and so she went ahead and finished the lesson. So the next day comes by and she's walking down the hospital hallway on the way to see another student. And this boy's nurse saw this teacher and said, what did you do to that boy yesterday? And this teacher melted and began a flurry of apologies saying that, that she was just doing what she thought would be best and that she is sorry for adding stress to his life at this time. The nurse stopped her and said, no, what I'm saying is he has totally turned around. He had not been responding to any treatment or even trying for us. He was lethargic in his spirit and had given up. Now today he is a different person. All of his levels are much better and there is a look of life in his eyes. What did you do in there? The nurse asked the teacher. And then several weeks later, as the boy was now out of the hospital, back in school, doing his normal thing, they learned from him what had happened that day. He said, while I was laying there, I thought I was going to die. And that, that no one wanted to tell me what was about to happen. The little boy said, I had given up. But when the teacher taught me that lesson, I thought to myself, they would not teach English to a boy who was about to die, would they? I realized I was going to live. You see, this young boy was given hope during a very vulnerable moment in his life. He was given hope through his teacher. He was given hope through his doctors. He was given hope through his nurses. He was given hope through his family. 
He was given hope through love. He was given hope through prayers. And what we're trying to say is that all of this was happening through Jesus Christ, who is full of hope. Jesus is powerful. He is hopeful. And number three, he is helpful as well. This paralyzed man in the text was completely helpless, but Jesus Christ was completely helpful. Look again in verse number 17, and, and Jesus is saying that my father and I, we've been working. It's not that we haven't been around for 38 years, but the time is right now, and, and we've healed you now, but we have been working. And we may not always see the Lord working in our lives the way that we feel like He should, but what we need to know is no matter how powerless, helpless, or hopeless we feel, the Lord is working in our lives. It's not miraculous in the first, as in the first century where people are coming back from the dead, but it is providentially, and it is powerful, it is hopeful, and it is helpful. The Apostle Paul in Acts 26, reflecting upon his conversion to Christ and talking and giving his defense, says, therefore, in verse 22 of Acts 26, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand. Romans 8 verse number 26, we learn that the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses when we are praying to God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son. And Hebrews chapter 4 verse number 16, the Bible says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And similarly, Hebrews 13, verse 6, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do to me. As we close this morning, I invite you to go back to verse number six of our text in John 5. And the question that is being asked to this paralyzed man by Jesus is a question that is relevant and applicable to us today as well. We are in a totally different situation 2,000 years later. But something that we all have in common is that we have sin in our lives. And if we are living as non-Christians full of sin, we need to be made well. And so the question asked to the paralyzed man is the question that we finished with this morning. Do you want to be made well? There is only one person who is able to make us well from an eternal perspective. And for in this life, ultimately, we need to direct all of our energy and all of our faith and all of our obedience to this man, Jesus Christ, who could not stop working. The bad news is that there once was a man who couldn't start walking. He was powerless. He was hopeless. He was helpless. But the good news this morning for him and the good news for us this morning is that there is the man, Jesus Christ, who cannot stop working in our lives. He is powerful. He is hopeful. And he is helpful. John 5, verse 24, Jesus in his eternal teaching, looking back at some of the events that had happened with this paralyzed man. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. 
When we're talking about wellness this morning, do we want to be made well? We are looking at that question from an eternal perspective. We want to pass from this life, pass from death into eternal life. And that is only possible through our Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning we sing this song of encouragement. We want you to be a Christian this morning. We want you to be filled with hope and power and help that only comes through Jesus. Will you come forward this morning believing and repenting, confessing and being baptized into Christ? Or will you come forward this morning repenting of sins and being restored to the Lord? If we can help you in any way this morning, will you come right now while together we stand and sing?